Lecture 5, Drying of Solids. The objectives of this lecture are to introduce the drying of solids, uh, also to introduce psychometric charts and key parameters for the drying of solids, and explain the drying process and drying curves. Drying is the removal of moisture from the sol solid solution slurries or pastes to give a solid product. This moisture can be water or as a volatile component. In the feed to a dryer, the moisture may be embedded in a wet solid, a liquid around a solid surface, or a solution in which the solid is dissolved. Drying can be a very expensive process, so it's critical to design dryers right. Drying can be extra expensive when there's large amounts of water that must be evaporated because water has very large heat vaporization, so it uses a lot of energy to vaporize the water. Recently, there have been advances in equipment design which have broadened the use of pre-feed dewatering operations by mechanical means, which reduces some of the costs and the length of drying cycles. These techniques include things such as gravity expression, pressure filtration, settling and centrifugation. As the drying involves the vaporization of moisture, heat must be transferred to the material being dried. There are four common modes of this heat transfer. The convection from a hot gas in contact with the material, or you can have conduction from a hot surface that's in contact with the material, you can have radiation from a hot gas or surface, or we can have heat generated within the material by either dielectric radio frequency or microwave heating. If moisture is to be evaporated from a wet solid, it must be heated to a temperature at which its vapour pressure exceeds the partial pressure of the moisture in the gas that's in contact with the wet solid. Calculations involving the properties of moisture gas mixtures uh, are commonly and conveniently carried out on what are called psychometric charts. For the use of psychometric charts, there are some key parameters that need to be known. The main one of these is the absolute humidity. The absolute humidity is commonly referred to in, as by mass, and it's the ratio of the vapour pressure of the moisture to the vapour pressure of the moisture free gas and then we have to modify this by the ratio of the molecular weight of our moisture and the molecular weight of our moisture free gas to convert this into mass. It is also possible to leave this ratio as a molar humidity. <coughs> the saturation humidity is defined the same as the absolute mass humidity apart from instead of using the actual vapour pressure of the moisture we use the saturation vapour pressure of the moisture divided by the total pressure minus the saturation pressure of the moisture i.e. the partial pressure of the moisture free gas if it was saturated with our moisture and then again modified by the ratio of our molecular weights the relative humidity is the ratio of the partial pressure of the moisture to the partial pressure of the moisture at saturation and then modified by 100. There's also the percentage humidity which is the ratio of the humidity to the humidity at saturation again modified by 100. There's also the humid volume which is the volume of moisture gas mixture per unit mass of moisture free gas. So you can see this is based upon the ideal gas law and then modified by the humidity of our moisture. There's the humid heat, which is the specific heat capacity of the moisture gas mixture per unit mass of moisture free gas. And it's taken as the specific heat capacity of the moisture free gas plus the specific heat capacity of the moisture times by the humidity. There's the total enthalpy, which is the enthalpy of the moisture gas mixer, 
per unit mass of moisture-free gas from the temperature of T0 and it's the humid heat times by the temperature rise from our standard temperature plus the heat of vaporization for the moisture times by the humidity. <coughs> there are then four key temperatures. The dew point temperature, which is the temperature at which the moisture begins to condense when the, moist when the mixture is cooled. The dry bulb temp temperature, which is the temperature of the mixture. The wet bulb temperature, which is a steady state temperature obtained by a thermometer that has the bulb covered by a small layer of the moisture and an adiabatic saturation temperature which is a temperature attained when the gas is saturated with moisture in an adiabatic process. So most of these parameters can be read off psychometric charts. So often you're given a dry bulb temperature and a wet bulb temperature for your system. So you can look at the x-axis for the dry bulb temperature and you can look at the red lines for the wet bulb temperature. When you find a point that corresponds to your wet bulb and dry bulb temperature, you can then read off the other key properties. So from the y-axis, you can read off the specific humidity. From, from the blue lines, you can read off the relative humidity. From the green lines, you can read off the specific volume of your mixture and from the dark green lines you can read off the enthalpy of your mixture. The important parameter for design of dryers is the temperature at which the moisture evaporates. If we have a convective hot gas employed to heat our mixture and the moisture is either on the surface of our solid or rapidly migrates to the surface from the interior of the solid, then the rate of evaporation is independent of the properties of the solid and is only governed by the rate of the convective heat transfer from our hot gas to our liquid surface. And at this conditions, the evaporating surface is at the wet bulb temperature of the gas if a dryer operates adiabatically. If the convective heat transfer is supplemented by radiation, then the temperature of the evaporating surface can be higher than the wet bulb temperature. In the absence of contact from a convecting heating gas, and when a sweep gas is not present, such that the dryer operates in a non-adiabatic manner, the evaporating moisture is at its boiling point temperature at the pressure inside the dryer. If the moisture contains dissolved non-volatile substances, then the boiling point temperature can be elevated. <coughs> the temperature at which moisture evaporates in a direct heated dryer is difficult to determine and it varies from the dryer inlet to the dryer outlet. If the dryer operates isobarically, adiabatically, and all the energy from the moisture evaporation is supplied by the hot gas by convection, then we can generate a simplified heat and mass transfer equations for the process, and we can use these to generate an expression for the temperature evaporation at a particular location in the dryer, operating under continuous steady state conditions, or for the temperature in the dryer at a particular time in a batch dryer. If it's further assumed that the moisture being evaporated is free liquid exerting its full vapour pressure at the surface of the solid, then this temperature in the dryer is the wet bulb temperature. So, as mentioned briefly before, the wet bulb temperature can be measured by covering a thermometer bulb in a wick saturated with the liquid being evaporated. So, in the picture at the bottom, we have our standard thermometer as the bottom thermometer, or our dry bulb temperature, and then above it, we have our wet bulb thermometer, which is the same thermometer apart from on the bulb we have a wick that is saturated 
in our moisture. So at steady state, the rate of convective heat transfer from the gas to the wet solid, so the equation on the left, must be equal to an enthalpy balance on the moisture being evaporated, the equation on the right. So our convective heat transfer is given by the convective heat transfer coefficient h times by the difference in temperature between our convective gas and the wet bulb temperature, which is the temperature of the surface of the moisture, times by the area available for the heat transfer. And the enthalpy of the moisture evaporated from the material is given by the molar rate of evaporated moisture, Na, times by the molecular weight of our moisture, times by the total of the heat of vaporization plus the specific heat capacity if we need to heat our material, if heat our moisture up from the wet bulb temperature to the temperature of our convective gas. The molar rate of evaporated moisture from the wet surface can be given using a mass transfer relationship. So it's equal to the mass transfer coefficient times by the difference between the fraction uh, on the surface to the fraction in our convective gas times the area and then that is divided by 1 minus the fraction in our gas to a log mean which gives us effects based on bulk f any bulk flow effects that there might be in the system. So we can combine these equations together give an overall balance. So we can make some assumptions and one of the assumptions is that because the mole fraction of moisture in the bulk gas and at the wet solid gas interface is quite small then the bulk flow effect must be small so we can reduce this 1 minus Ya log mean to 1. Also, in most cases, the latent heat is much greater than the sensible heat. So we can reduce our heat of vaporization plus the adjustment of the temperature to the convective gas temperature to be equal to just the enthalpy of vaporization. This means that we can simplify our equation to the following. So if we replace our vapour pressure of the moisture with our mole fraction of moisture times by the total pressure into our definition of the absolute humidity, we can rearrange this equation to get an expression for the mole fraction of our moisture in our gas in terms of the humidity and the ratio of the, of the molecular weight of the dry gas and the molecular weight of the moisture. We can substitute this value for the mole fraction into our heat balance and we can rearrange this to get an expression for the wet bulb temperature in terms of the temperature of our convective gas minus an expression involving the mass transfer coefficient and the heat transfer coefficients and the humidity of the surface of the moisture and the humidity of our convective gas. From last year, you should remember the chiltern colburn analogy for mass and heat transfer. So, as a reminder, the chiltern colburn analogy is a widely used analogy between heat, momentum and mass transfers. And it is derived based on the fact that the basic mechanisms in mathematics for heat, mass, and momentum transport are essentially the same. And it was developed to directly relate heat transfer coefficient, mass transfer coefficients, and also friction factors to, to each other.
and it permits the prediction of an unknown transfer coefficient when one of the other coefficients is known. So we can take our Chilton Colburn analogy and rearrange this uh, and get our grouping of mass transfer coefficient times by the molecular weight of the dry gas divided by the heat transfer coefficient and say this is equal to the inverse of the specific heat capacity for our dry gas and a function of the Lewis number. The Lewis number is the ratio of the Smith number to the Prandtl number. And you can look this number up for a wide variety of systems. We can then substitute this expression into our relation for the wet bulb temperature. To give the wet bulb temperature in terms of the temperature of the convective gas, the enthalpy of vaporization of the moisture, the specific heat capacity, our Lewis number, and the difference between the saturation humidity at our wet bulb temperature and the humidity of the convective gas. Now for water at, a, at about 20 degrees, the Lewis number is 0.855 which means that 1 over the Lewis number to the power of 2 thirds is approximately 1. So we can rewrite our wet bulb temperature for water to be only dependent on the temperature of the convective gas, the enthalpy of vaporization of the water, the specific heat capacity, the saturation humidity, and the humidity of the convective gas, which is the same relationship you would get if you did a material balance based around the saturation temperature. So for water, the wet bulb temperature tends to be very similar to the saturation temperature. So if you don't have the information to get the wet bulb temperature, for water a good approximation is just using the saturation temperature. For drying, solid materials tend to be classified into two types. The first type is a granular or crystalline solid. So in these types of solids, the moisture tends to be held in open pores between the particles. So these include mostly inorganic materials like crushed rocks or sand, um, sodium phosphates or, or catalyst materials. During drying, the solid is unaffected by the moisture removal. So selection of the drying conditions and the drying rate is not very critical to the properties and the appearance of the dry product. Yeah. And because of this open pore structure, uh, the water moves, e the moisture moves easily to the surface of the material. So materials in this category can often be dried very rapidly to very low moisture contents. The second type of solid material is a fibrous, amorphous and gel-like materials. They tend to dissolve moisture or trap moisture in their fibres or in a very fine pore structure. These mainly tend to be organic solids such as wood or leather, cotton, starch, and materials like that. These materials tend to be affected by moisture removal and they often shrink when they're dried and swell if they're wetted. With these materials, because the moisture is trapped inside, drying in the later stages can be very slow. And because of this change in size with change in moisture content, if the surface is dried too rapidly, then damage can occur to the solid. When monitoring the drying of materials, it's common to use the average moisture content, which is given as the mass of moisture per 100 mass units of dry solid. So as the drying process occurs, there's a decrease in the average moisture content. And this decrease is seen regardless of the classification of solid materials that is used. If we take our moisture content against time drying curve and differentiate it with respect to the time, we get a curve representing the rate of drying against the moisture content. The rate of drying is given by that differential times by 
the mass of dry solid over the interfacial area between the mass of wet solid and the gas, or it's given by the change in the mass of moisture taken off the solid per unit time times by 1 over the interfacial area between the mass of wet solid and the gas. From the drying rate curve, we can see that the drying process passes through four key regions between A and B, B to C, C to D, and then D and to the end of our drying process. The region from A to B is known as the preheating region, and this is the, the part of the drying process where the wet solid is being heated up uh, to the temperature that is equal to the wet bulb gas, while during this process the moisture is still being evaporated at an increasing rate. At the end of this preheating period, the exposed surface of the solid is still completely covered by a film of moisture. The region from B to C is known as the constant drying rate period. And so long as there is free moisture that covering the exposed surface of the solid, the drying rate will stay constant. This surface moisture may be part of the original moisture that covered the surface, or it can be moisture that's been brought up to the surface, either in the case of our first category of solids, capillary action through the large pores, or in the case of our second class of solids, liquid diffusion through the more gel-like membrane material of the solid. In either case, as there is moisture on the surface of the solid, the drying rate is controlled by external mass and heat transfer between the exposed surface of the wet solid and the bulk gas, and not by any transport through the solid material. When drying wet solids of the, of the first porous category, if you have these under agitated materials such that all the particle surfaces are in direct contact with your uh, heated gas, the constant drying rate period may extend all the way down to your equilibrium moisture content. The region from C to D is known as the first falling rate drying period and this is the period where the surface of the solid starts to dry. At point C, the moisture just barely covers the exposed surface and then the surface tends to a dry state because the rate of the travelling of the moisture up through the solid, either by diffusion or capillary action to the exposed surface, is not sufficiently fast to keep a layer of moisture on the surface of the solid. In this region, the exposed surface temperature remains at the wet bulb temperature so long as the heat conduction is adequate. But the wetted area exposed to the convective gas to allow mass transfer is decreased. Consequently, the rate of drying decreases approximately linearly with decreasing average moisture content. The region from D to the end of a drying process is often known as the second falling rate drying period. And evaporation occurs from the liquid surface in the pores where the wet bulb temperature prevails. However, because there's so much exposed solid surface, the surface temperature of the solid increases and approaches the dry bulb temperature of the gas. In this region, the rate of drying may be controlled by either diffusion of vapour through the pores for our first porous category of solids or by liquid diffusion through the solid material for our second class of non-porous solids. Due to this, the rate of drying tends to fall exponentially with decreasing moisture content. In the last lecture, we saw that we could split the drying process into four key regions. The main region is the constant drying rate period. In direct heat transfer equipment, drying involves transfer of heat from the gas to the surface and the interior of the wet solid.
and then mass transfer of the moisture from the interior and surface of a solid to the gas. During the constant rate period, the rate of mass transfer is determined by the gas phase boundary layer or film resistance at the wet surface of the solid. And the wet solid is assumed to be at a uniform temperature. So the only resistance to convective heat transfer is the gas phase. This means that we can say that the rate of moisture evaporated can be based on the convective heat transfer or on the mass transfer from the surface of the moisture to the convective gas. So the rate of moisture evaporation is the heat transfer coefficient times by the difference in temperature between the convective gas and the interface times by the area of the interface divided by the enthalpy of vaporization and for the mass transfer part this is the mass transfer coefficient times by the mole fraction in the at the interface minus that in the convective gas times by the area of that interface and then times by the molecular weight of the moisture to have this on our mass basis that we tend to use for drying. In this case, as we just have a sweet gas providing the heat and we're assuming an adiabatic dryer, we can say that the interface uh, is actually the conditions of the wet wall temperature. Although drying rate calculations could be based on the mass transfer part of the equation, it is more common to use the heat transfer part, especially when the sweet gas is air and the moisture is water. This is because psychometric charts tend to be widely available for that system. With water, we have the equality of the wet bulb and the adiabatic saturation temperatures and there is a much wider availability of correlations for convective heat transfer coefficients than there is for mass transfer coefficients. Remembering that the drying rate is given by the rate of moisture evaporated from the surface per time times by 1 over the interfacial area, we can substitute in our relationship from the heat transfer balance and generate a relationship for the constant rate. So the constant rate is given by the, heat the convective heat transfer coefficient times by the difference between the temperature of our sweet gas and the temperature of our moisture, which is the wet bulb temperature, divided by the enthalpy of vaporization for our moisture. There are several correlations given for the convective heat transfer coefficient in different types of dryer in the notes. The drying rate is also given by the change in moisture content with time times by the mass of a dry solid over the interfacial area. So we can rearrange this to get an expression for the time with the integral of the rate with the moisture change in moisture content. So if we ignore any preheating, which tends to be a minor part of a drying process, we can say that for the constant rate period, our rate e is equal to the, the constant value we have just developed. And we can integrate starting from the initial free moisture content, x0, at our time equals t, to the moisture content at the end of the drying rate period at a time equals Tc, which is the time for constant rate drying. So if we substitute this in and integrate, because our rate is constant, we can take that out of the integral. So we simply get that the time taken for the constant rate drying period is equal to the mass of a dry solid times by the change in moisture content from the start concentration to the end of the constant drying rate 
concentration divided by our interfacial area for drying and our constant rate, drying rate. When the drying rate in the constant rate drying period is high, or the distance that the interior moisture must travel to reach the surface is large, moisture may fail to reach the surface fast enough to maintain a constant drying rate, and we transition into the first falling rate period. When moisture travels from the interior of a wet solid to the surface, a moisture profile develops in the wet solid. The profile shape depends on the nature of the moisture movement. There are two main mechanisms for this moisture removal. Either the moisture is not held in solution or in fibres, but is free moisture in spaces between either the particles or the fibres, and the moisture moves to the surface by capillary action. Or the internal moisture is a bound moisture, as in the last stages of drying uh, paper or wood and the moisture in this case migrates to the surface by liquid diffusion. So in the falling rate drying period, two methods can be used to calculate the drying rate. The first is by using theories for capillary flow and diffusion and generating a series of equations to estimate the drying rates. Or, estimates can be made on an empirical approach, ignoring the actual mechanism, but relying on experimental determination of the drying rate as a function of the average moisture content for a set of particular conditions. The second method is generally easier, however, these experiments need to be carried out for each different type of material that needs drying and for each different type of dryer you might be drying that material in. As the first falling rate drying period often has a linear decrease in the drying rate, often we can make a simple approximation to the drying rate <coughs> by taking it as a linear decrease from the value of the rate from the constant rate drying period. So now we substitute this expression for the rate of drying into our integral form to get the drying time. So this time we integrate from the end of the constant rate drying period to our time t. And we also integrate from the moisture content at the end of the constant rate drying period to our moisture content relating to our time t. So doing this gives the ex following expression for the drying time in the falling rate period. And again we can see that it's only dependent on our constant drying rate, our moisture content at the end of our constant drying rate, the mass of the dry solid and the area for drying. So from these two expressions for the constant rate drying time and the falling rate drying time we can calculate the time taken for our total drying period which is just the sum of these two drying times. So in this lecture we saw an introduction to the drying of solids and an introduction to psychometric charts and their key parameters. We also looked at the drying process and had an analysis of the drying curves that classify drying processes.